So good to see all of you here, each one of you braving the you know April snow, which I'm sure we're all uh, excited about. Um, my name is David Newfeld. I'm a prof history here at Grable. I also direct our Institute for Anabaptist and Mennonite Studies. So it's my pleasure to welcome you all here uh, on behalf of the college. Many of us gathered here tonight continue to live, work, and indeed write on the traditional territories of the Atawandaran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. Encounters between Mennonite settlers and indigenous people on this land began in the early 1800s, about 20 years after the Haldeman Proclamation of 1784, granted six miles on each side of the Grand River from source to mouth to the Haudenosaunee. With recognition of the ways that settlers have violated the intent of this grant, since that time, we commit to approaching ongoing encounters with a good spirit and a desire to right our relationships. We're, heard, we're here this evening to celebrate the launch of Hilde Frey's Thiessen's new book on Mennonites writing, selected essays edited by Robert Zacharias and published by Canadian Mennonite University Press. We're privileged to welcome both of you back here, uh, Hilde and Rob, to introduce us to this exciting project. My role this evening, you'll be happy to hear, is limited. After introducing Hilde and Rob, uh, author and editor uh, will uh, be given opportunity to familiarize you with uh, this project in a variety of ways, offering commentary, giving us a better idea, a taste of uh, its content through a selection of readings. We'll end our session with a brief Q&A where you can address questions to both author and editor. And we'll then invite you downstairs to the atrium where you can enjoy some snacks and most importantly, purchase Hildy's book. Hildy Frey's Thiessen is Professor Emerita of English and Peace and Conflict Studies here at Conor Grable University College. She taught her first course here in 1983 joining the faculty full-time in 1987 and taking on a wide variety of roles, registrar for the Masters of Theological Studies program, dean, and for five months in 1995, interim president, uh, right from the start. While pursuing research in the literature and art of Mennonites and other diasporas in Canada, Hilde introduced the college and its community to the burgeoning field of Mennonite writing. Through workshops, lectures, and community suppers, she invited Mennonite writers doing work across North America to engage with students and public audiences. And she convened the communities of writers. She helped bring into conversation at series of readings, including here at Grable as late as 2012, a practice that Rob picked up here as well a few years later. Tonight, we're focusing on Hildy's writing and early responses to On Mennonites writing are glowing. This from uh, Jeff Gundy. Uh, Hilde Frey's Thiessen has played an essential role in the remarkable flowering of Mennonites writing over what is now a half century. The publication of this volume of her essays reveals anew the great generosity, critical acumen, and encyclopedic knowledge that Thiessen has offered to the Mennonite writing community, one that she has actively nurtured and guided into being over her long career as a critic, editor, and organizer. This gathering is a great gift to anyone interested in that writing. And from Julia Kasdorf, a poet and scholar at Penn State. This remarkable collection maps the rise of 50 years of Mennonites writing in North America by Hilde Frey's Thiessen, who shaped and named a field. Neither sociology nor theology on Mennonites writing shines light on North American Mennonite experiences and cultural memories in the latter half of the 20th century. Finally, it makes me grateful for Hilde's vision, focus, and determined work all these years and for Robert Zacharias's effort to gather, contextualize, and place these essays within reach. I cannot imagine the land of Menolit without either of them. Kasdorf's last couple sentences there give me an opportunity to introduce uh, Robert Zacharias. 
as well, Associate Professor of English at York University and Associate Editor of the Journal of Mennonite Studies. Last year, Rob gave the John and Margaret Friesen lectures in Anabaptist Mennonite Studies at Canadian Mennonite University, focusing on Mennonite literature, a subject on which he has published several books, Rewriting the Break Event, Mennonites and Migration in Canadian Literature, published in 2013 with the University of Manitoba Press, Reading Mennonite Writing, a study in minor transnationalism with Penn State University Press in 2022, a book that was shortlisted for the Gabriel Roy Prize for Excellence in Canadian Literary Criticism, and Rob is also the editor of After Identity, Mennonite Literature in North America, published in 2015, excuse me. One year prior to that, as a postdoctoral fellow here at University of Waterloo, as I alluded to, uh, Rob organized and hosted a series, a uh, reading series in Mennonite literature here at Grable, featuring Rudy Weeb, Miriam Taves, Di Brandt, and others. His current research uh, includes a digital humanities project entitled Distant Reading, Mennonite Writing, and a large anthology of Mennonite literary, literary criticism reaching back into the middle of the 19th century. Rob, I welcome you here and invite you up here to tell us a bit more on about how On Mennonite's writing came together. Well, thank you, uh, David, and thank you to all of you for braving the weather and coming out to help us uh, celebrate uh, a book, which is really an excuse to celebrate uh, Hilde Frey's Thiessen's uh, career. Uh, you'll see a bit of me today. We'll be juggling back and forth a bit. Uh, I'm going to say a bit now about how the book kind of came to be. I'll come back in a little bit to give you a better introdu uh, introduction to Hildy herself, and then I'll say a few things later on about uh, what you might expect or approaches to coming into the book as a reader. But I'll start uh, with this discussion about um, how the book came to be. And fortunately, that's what the preface is about. So I'm just going to take it as an excuse to read a, a page or two from the, from the preface. The first time I suggested a collection such of this to Hilde Frey's Thiessen, she literally waved the idea away. It was well over. Do you remember this? OK. <laughs> we haven't discussed our talk today. Uh, it was well over a decade ago, and my research on a dissertation on Mennonite literature kept turning up essays, special issues of journals, interviews, and collections by the same author. My research notes from this period are filled with cited passages and key terms, often underlined and circled in bold, all accompanied by the same set of initials, HFT. These essays, they spanned decades and were scattered across a range of venues. Some were tucked away in small Mennonite affiliated publications, others in leading academic journals. How could there be so many essays by the same author, I wondered, and why had they never been gathered together in one place? This HFT had edited half a dozen collections of other people's work in the field. Where was her own? Yet when I had the opportunity to finally meet her in person and ask if she had ever considered undertaking the project of gathering some of her own essays together into a volume, Hildy, then very much still Dr. Fraze Thiessen to me, responded with a shake of her head and a wave of her hand. And would I ever consider it? She continued, suddenly serious. No. <clears throat> so it was with some trepidation that I suggested this project a second time in the fall of 2022. I had begun work on a large critical anthology of Mennonite literary criticism in North America, and I had come upon a problem. The premise for that project is to create an authoritative record of some of the most significant critical commentary on Mennonite literature in Canada and the United States. And I had reached out to experts in the field for suggestions on, on what I should include. The first one responded, well, as for all the Hildy essays, I have no idea how you'll choose just one or two. The next responded, quote, 
Well, and of course you'll need to have any number from Hildy. Good luck deciding which ones to leave out. I was working with Canadian Mennonite University Press for this project, so I decided I'd solve this problem by proposing a second collection, one dedicated solely to collecting Hildy's most notable and influential works. After the press responded enthusiastically, I gathered up my courage and I pitched the project to Hildy a second time. The press, I said, it's already on board. And, I, and, I, uh, and adding that I could serve as editor, and I could do, could do much of the legwork myself. Hildy wrote back cautiously. I'm quoting here. Let me say enough of a yes, and the yes is in quotation marks. Let me say enough of a yes, she wrote back, to allow you and me to move forward in conversation, end quote. Sometimes you have to take what you can get. <laughs> so what changed in the intervening period? Hildy had retired nearly a decade earlier, it's true, but she had continued to be as prolific as ever. I'm learning slowly that academics don't really retire. They just, just stop teaching, it seems. A press was on board this time, yes, and someone offering to do the legwork. But since when did Hildy Fraze Thiessen need help with such trifling matters? My guess, then as now, is that the retrospective gaze currently at play in the larger field of Mennonite literary studies, as the field sort of collectively undertakes, in the words of a recent conference, the work of reflecting on the past and creating a future, made the prospect of gathering the work together suddenly more palpable to her, just as it made it more urgent to me. Whatever the reason, I'm thankful for the change of heart and thrilled to have been able to help bring on Mennonite's writing into being and into the, this room uh, tonight. Now, before I pass it over to Hildy to say a few words and then pass the ball back to me, I want to take this opportunity to also publicly thank a few of the other people involved in bringing the project uh, into being. Uh, first, that's the folks over at Canadian Mennonite University Press uh, in Winnipeg. The press's uh, new editor, Dr. Sue Sorensen, is an English professor there, uh, and she is eager and sharp and uh, ambitious. She cold called me one day to see if I might have anything to do with liter Mennonite literature that I'd be interested in uh, partnering with her on. And then she just kept calling until I decided, OK, I could do something here. Sue has a, um, a crystal clear vision for what she wants uh, for, the pro for, the, uh, for the press. And there's a bunch of interesting projects coming down the pipe there. And I'm thrilled to have been able to work with her on this, um, uh, on this project. So thank you to Sue, although she's not here, of course. I should say thank you also to Jonathan Dick, the graphic novelist and uh, designer who helped with the, put the book together. Uh, Jonathan, I knew him first from The Walrus. He did this uh, reading, uh, Mennonites reading Miriam Taves' uh, uh, graphic uh, novel or comic strip in The Walrus years ago. Uh, and then he has a graphic novel out last year called Shelter Belts. Uh, and he's a, a wonderful artist. And I'm thrilled to be able to work with him on this one again. And then finally, to uh, the press's assistant, Katie Zawatsky, who helped copy edit, and get the permissions and all that uh, behind, the, behind the scenes stuff uh, that's necessary and often uh, overlooked. Thanks, too, to the various publishers. Most of the work here has been published before in various journals. Uh, and so to reprint them here, of course, we need to get permissions. And the editors at MQR, JMS and Connor and Grable uh, Review and so on have generously allowed us to reprint them here. Thanks, of course, to David and the team here at Grable for hosting us tonight, and of course to Hildy for uh, trusting me to work on this project with her, even if it took a decade to convince her. All right, Hildy, I'll let you have this. Sorry, Thank you, Rob. I feel so far away from everybody here. It's lovely to see almost all familiar faces. That's a, just a wonderful treat. Sorry. Well, as Rob indicated, this book has been, I mean, he didn't put it this way, but I feel it this way. That book has been a gift. It was a gift. It is a gift. Um, this is it. I've spent a few hours with this book in anticipation of the launch tonight, and as a fan of print, as my son Chris would call it, I'd like to remark on what a handsome volume it is. It looks good, 
nice end sheets and everything. It feels good. Um, and uh, the weight of the paper, the generous margins, the pliable spine, the overall design, they're all a product of the astute choices of Sue Sorensen at the press. As to the management of the text itself, uh, I'd like to thank Sue for that. She was hands-on throughout, and she is a kind of, I mean, I think the first time Rob described her to me, he got to know her before I did, was that she's a force of nature, and in fact she is. But it was the vision and insight and tenacity and grace, forbearance and skill of Rob Zacharias that uh, the book's initiator and editor and my collaborator tonight that brought this text to life. Thank you, Rob. I'm sure when you started, you didn't think it would be quite as <laughs> much work as it finally was. And I'd like to thank also the Mennonite Brethren Historical Commission, interesting, um, for their publication grant and for tonight, the college, Dean Troy Osborne, Birgit Moskinski, Jen Konkel, and of course, David Chair for the evening. I've offered other thank yous in the book itself, especially to many friends and colleagues who in one way or another encouraged me on this. Really, it's a half century of work along the way. And of course, my husband Paul, whom most of you know, my supporter and collaborator on all things, and all my children and grandchildren, including the one who's squawking in the back, uh, all of whom inspire me every day. So thank you, thank you, thank you. The image of a poetry reading announced itself to me while I thought about what Rob and I might say this evening. Well, what we'll be reading tonight is not exactly poetry, but we will offer mostly poem-sized, or at least I will, poem-sized snippets, two or three minute swatches of what we've written with commentary. On my part, I'll probably introduce almost every swatch that I read, and I'm not necessarily going to tell you whether I'm reading an introduction or part of the book, but uh, just because it gets too crazy. So that's just the way I'll work. Our approach will illustrate, though, I think, that the book does not need to be read from front to back, though it could be. We'll dip into it here and there, as Rob just did, and give you a taste of what's inside. Thank you all for coming tonight, and I hope you'll enjoy what we have to offer. Rob. All right, my turn. So I will admit it feels a little strange, this part, to be introducing Hildy Frey's season here at a stage at Connor Grable to you, an audience from Waterloo, uh, full of family and friends, colleagues, and so on. However, it's possible that there are somebody here, some, that there's somebody here, or maybe somebody watching, uh, who, like me, came to know Hildy first as a name in print on the cover of a book or the top of an essay. Uh, and so could use an introduction, a little bit, quick introduction to a little bit more of Hildy the person. Or it's possible that you know Hildy uh, as a, a family member or a friend and don't quite appreciate who Hildy is as an academic. So I'll take a few minutes uh, of your time to introduce Hildy here. Hildy was born in Manitoba to Ruslander parents, that is, Russian Mennonite parents who arrived in Canada in the 1920s following a dramatic escape from the Soviet Union, and she attended Mennonite Brethren Collegiate Institute in Winnipeg before completing her undergraduate studies at the University of Winnipeg. From, Edmund, sorry, from Winnipeg, she moved to Edmonton, where she completed an MA and a PhD at the University of Alberta. And Hildy's first academic essay, published in 1973, so yes, exactly 50 years prior to the publication of her collection here, uh, was published when she was still a grad student. And it was one of the earliest scholarly uh, examination of Rudy Weeb's fiction. And in fact, Hildy and I had a healthy debate about whether or not to include that first essay here in this collection. And I'm happy to say it's one of the few debates with Hildy that I've managed to win, and it is included uh, in the collection. And, and the argument 
that I made there and that I reiterate in the introduction is that it's valuable not only as its own standalone piece, that I think it still holds up 50 years later, which is remarkable on its own, but also that it so clearly anticipates the direction of Hildy's career to come. First, it was published in the Journal of Canadian Fiction, so not a Mennonite publication, uh, and it was promptly republished in an edited collection by a noted Canadianist and another non-Mennonite, John Moss. And, I, and this is significant in the period uh, because there were a few people starting to write and respond to the emerging uh, literature by Mennonites. Uh, but that conversation was very much still an in-house conversation in publications like Mennonite Life and Mennonite Quarterly Review. It was being written by Mennonites for Mennonite readers. And moving that conversation into the academic sphere uh, with the assumption, and it turned out to be correct, that others might be interested in this too, is a significant moment uh, for the field of Mennonite studies. The very idea that you could publish an idea on Mennonite literature in a serious scholarly journal that wasn't edited by someone you went to church with, this was uh, nearly unprecedented. And so if you'll let me, I just want to read literally the first line from that essay. So this is the first essay that Hildy ever published, uh, and its first sentence. It begins, Rudy Weeb's Please Sell Destroy Many and the Blue Mountains of China function within the Canadian literary context, not only as works of prairie fiction, but also as documents that illuminate, illuminate Mennonitism, a particular religious and ethnic orientation which has impressed itself upon the prairie landscape for the past 100 years. So remember, this is well before a critical mass of writing by and about Mennonites mostly Russian Mennonites, would emerge in the 80s. This, that so-called Mennonite miracle of Patrick Friesen and Di Brandt and Birdsell and others. And so this was well before such work would make it possible for other scholars to imagine a, a well-recognized contemporary discourse of Mennonite literary studies. But here in that first line of published work, published as a grad student, Hildy confidently presents Rudy work, Rudy's work as reflecting a distinctly Mennonite form of writing, which she defines in ethnic and religious terms, all while claiming a place for such work within the scholarly realm of Canadian literary studies. It's a, it's a remarkable moment. Do you agree that we're, we should have included it? Yes, excellent. Anyways, I digress. So the, the collection operates valuably on its own in individual essays, I think. But when they map over the course of a career, we get to see not only the, the sort of the trans, uh, trajectory of Hildy's thinking, but also of a shift in Canadian literary studies. A sort of, you get a sense of momentum that comes along with it because of the, we're, we positioned them chronologically. Uh, and you get a, the best tour guide along the way with Hildy. In any case, Hildy moved here to Waterloo in 1974. Uh, finishing up her PhD, and she began teaching at Wilfrid Laurier and here at Conrad Grable. It was during this time that she started teaching English 218, Mennonite Literature, which was Canada's first academic course in Mennonite writing here at Grable, uh, just before, even before securing her faculty position here, which she did in 1940, sorry, <laughs> 1987, 1987. And what can we say about the years after she arrived here? Well, let me tell you a little story. When we came up with the idea for this collection, I invited Hildy to write a new essay for the collection, which we could include. I said, maybe as a conclusion or as a short afterward, just a, a few words on the collection as a whole. Uh, I think maybe make it five pages or so, I think I suggested. Well, Hildy being Hildy, that off afterward is now, I think, the longest piece in the collection at around 30 pages. And in that afterward, she reflects on her time at Grable in some length. <clears throat> You'll have to buy the book for all those juicy details, but there's at least one thing in there that I remember when I read it, I disagreed with uh, immediately. In that, in that uh, conclusion or afterward, she describes her surprise and good fortune at having come of age, academic age, at the time of this new Mennonite writing, and at the time of Mennonite literary studies emergence in Canada. She writes, quote, 
I had simply been, somehow, all those years in the right place at the right time. I had been given an astonishing range of opportunities to observe a close hand and to comment upon a singular literary phenomenon." End quote. Now, in one sense, of course, that's true. She had good timing. But as I wrote in my introduction, I fear that framing it as an astonishing range of opportunities that had been given to her is a bit misleading. I want to read here just a page or so from my introduction. So, at Conrad Grable College, Hildy's interest in Mennonite writing was met with strong institutional support. Within five years of her arrival, she had, <clears throat> she had organized and hosted uh, the first major scholarly conference in Mennonite literature, Mennonites Writing in Canada, alongside of which she undertook a truly her her Herculean, Herculean, excuse me, series of editorial projects, including the first fully English language anthology of Mennonite literature called Li Liars and Rascals, great title, the first three special issues of non-Mennonite affiliated literary journals dedicated to Mennonite literature, including a double issue of their respected literary magazine, The New Quarterly, and two issues of Prairie Fire. She also edited, co-edited Acts of Concealment, Mennonites Writing in Canada, a collection with uh, Peter Hinchcliffe of The New Quarterly, which included essays and creative work from the 1990 conference. And in this same five-year period, she also convinced the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada to fund an extended series of interviews with dozens of Mennonite literary authors. And she also contributed an entry on Mennonite poetry for the Mennonite Encyclopedia. Shortly thereafter, she began a literary refraction series for the Conrad Grable uh, Review, which over the course of some 14 issues the next decade, she would use to introduce new work by Mennonite writers in Canada and the United States. If it is true that Hildy always seemed to be in the right place and at the right time in those early years, in other words, it was usually, le usually less a matter of simple good fortune than it was because she had organized the event herself and was hosting it too. So that brings us to 1995. I'm going to rush through the next 30 years. But let's just say there's a good reason that the American scholar Daniel Shank Cruz likes to refer to Hildy as the, quote, godmother of Mennonite literary criticism. Not only did she organize the first conference and gave the name its distinctive, uh, or the field, excuse me, its distinctive name, that Mennonite's writing with the, with the slash. I'm so glad that, oops, so glad it ended up on the cover. She also sat on the organizing committee for all nine international conferences that have followed in that first one's wake. She gave keynote addresses at many of them. She has organized a number of high profile reading series here at Grable, uh, as David mentioned, bringing people like Rudy and David Bergen and Di Brandt and Julia Kasdorf and Jeff and others uh, here to this stage. I think many of you, like I, were at a lot of those readings. And of course, she has amassed a truly remarkable body of Mennonite literary criticism. She's edited some 14 books or special issues of journals on the subject. In addition to the ones I've already mentioned, she's edited several issues of Conrad Grable Review and Rhubarb Magazine. She co-edited volumes on Ephraim Weber and Voldemar Neufeld. And in 2017, she edited 11 Encounters with Midnight Fiction, which is a lovely collection that I'm told is around tonight. Again, I'm told she retired sometime in 2012, but it's hard to believe, given that she has continued to help organizing readings and conferences and continued to publish a pace and has just you know, generally continued her benevolent reign over the field. In total, over the past 50 years, Hildy has published over 80 works on Mennonite literature, including book chapters, essays, public lectures, introductions, interviews, reviews, reflections, and encyclopedia entries. 80. And yet she never bothered to collect the best of them into a single place, until now. So I'm so thankful for Hildy's tireless and brilliant work in helping to establish Mennonite writing as a field of study that I and others have been able to engage and explore. 
And I'm, again, thankful to be able to have had this opportunity to explore the project with her. But now I should pass the things back over to Hildy so you can hear more about the collection from the godmother herself. Oh, wow. This is so much fun. <laughs> I want to offer a few notes by way of context to begin. Uh, four notes, they're a paragraph each. Number one, Mennonite writing is a vibrant field that continues to grow and evolve. This book focuses on how the field we refer to as Mennonite's writing blossomed and gathered momentum, especially in the last few decades of the 20th century. While many of the writers whose work defined the era that took shape in the 80s continue to write, They've been joined by many new Mennonite writers who are writing, for the most part, in a new register. I'm thinking of writers in Canada and the United States, as well as writers who were emerging among the thousands of Mennonites around the world, more and more of whom are giving expression in creative prose and poetry to their own distinctive perspectives on life in general. Just about a week ago, I learned of Irene Langemann, for example, an award-winning filmmaker born in Siberia, whose new German novel, Das Gedächtnis der Techte, The Memory of the Daughters, chronicles six generations of a Mennonite family beginning in West Prussia in the 19th century. There are ever more Mennonite writers around the world, fresh voices giving expression to diverse and distinctive points of view. My work deals mostly with the emergence of this literary field that began to flourish during the closing decades of the last century. Before that, Mennonites had composed prose and poetry, but in German and Low German. Snatches of German and Low German, the Russian Mennonites' mother tongues, continued to find a place in Mennonite writing for some time. These German expressions, this code switching, besides evoking earlier days, serve to confirm a certain quality in this literature, a quality that affirms the trope of Mennonites as distinctive, as a people apart. Three, some of the most prominent texts to appear during the flowering of Mennonite literature deal with various forms of shunning, with the Mennonites' obsession with notions of insiders and outsiders. Most of the earliest writers assumed that because they had the temerity to write at all and then publish what they had to say, they'd be relegated permanently to the role of outsiders relative to their own communities. But as the binary paradigm of us and them that had defined the structure and function of many Mennonite communities were gradually dismantled, many Mennonite writers embraced the possibility that they could both question the givens by which they had been taught to live and refused to go away. Once seen as unruly, disruptive, Mennonite writers became, for many Mennonite readers at least, the architects of a new community. In many instances, Mennonite readers embraced Mennonite writing as a kind of homeland. This becomes so obvious to me. I'm, I'm part of a group of women who meet maybe four or five times a year, sometimes in person, mostly you know, on Zoom or something like that. We, we all went to high school together and we all grew up in the Mennonite Brethren Church. I'm the only one that has any connection with a, a, an ongoing Mennonite community, 10 people, a few of whom were excommunicated along the way. Number four. This is southwestern Ontario, where Russian and Swiss Mennonites comfortably coexist. But their histories and cultural histories are different. Most of the Mennonite writers we identify with the early years of the movement were Russian Mennonites from western Canada. Also players in these early years were American Swiss Mennonites like Jeff Gundy and Julia Kasdorf. Now there are many Swiss Mennonite writers of note, including Waterloo's own Carrie Snyder, and prominent American writers like Rachel Yoder and Sophia Samatar. In Canada, there were few writers among the Swiss Mennonites whose work predated that late 20th century flowering. These were from Waterloo County. Mabel Dunham, of course, comes to mind, author of Trail of the Conestoga, first published in 1924. 
and Ephraim Weber, another local native whose novel about Kitchener Mennonites, a draft of which Paul and I found in the National Library, remains unpublished. Some of you will have heard me speak of Weber in an EB lecture almost 20 years ago, where I began like this. What follows is in large measure a respectful investigation into the life of a man who grew up among the Mennonites of Waterloo County, Ontario, well over 100 years ago, but who found the Mennonites' way of life not conducive to the realization of his deepest longing to be a writer. Like so many writers, perhaps like many of us, Ephraim Weber occupied several worlds and was comfortable in none. I want nothing so much as to write, he wrote Lucy Maud Montgomery in 1903 at the beginning of their lifelong epistolary friendship. As we shall see, Weber would leave the Mennonites in order to realize his longing to be a writer, and following the pattern of the epics, he would return finally to the place from which he had begun and see it differently. I'll begin, I wrote then, by placing what I have to say into the context of my own scholarly interests, which have been focused over the past several years on the emergence of a significant body of creative literature written by Mennonites in Canada. <clears throat> I've been interested in particular in two things, the often uneasy relationship between Mennonite writers and their communities as one affects the other, and the impact that Mennonite literature has had on the construction of Mennonite identity in our time. I'm interested in how Mennonite writers respond to their communities and their communities to them, and in the fact that writers of Mennonite heritage, whether they embrace or reject the communities that nurtured them, contribute in any case to the construction, to our conception of the Mennonite, both within the Mennonite community and without. Okay, this time I'll be brief and just say a couple of things about the contents of the book itself. You'll remember I said Hildy's written something like 80 pieces in the field. So I was on sabbatical one year and I managed to work my way through them. And it was from that list then in consultation with Hildy that we chose the 18 essays that are included in the collection now. So 16 of these pieces were previously published in, can, in 10 different scholarly venues. And in those 16 are included all of what I would consider to be her most uh, influential and significant uh, uh, contributions. So essays with titles like Mother Tongue as Shibboleth, for example, or Beyond the Binary, and, uh, and several of her keynote addresses that she gave at the um, Mennonite Writing Conferences. There are also two pieces in the collection that are published here for the first time. One that was given as a public lecture in 2010, and the new afterward. And of course, there is my own introduction in which I try to contextualize uh, Hildy's work within the larger emergence of uh, Mennonite literary studies in North America, uh, and to kind of walk through the themes and concerns that emerge across uh, half a century of Hildy's work. So how should readers approach a book like this? Well, I could suggest a couple of possibilities. I expect, I hope and expect, it will be useful for scholars who are looking down, looking to track down Hildy's key works. That body of, or that collection of work that I was, when I was scattering around trying to find all the essays in various journals, some of which are no longer uh, publishing and so on, now we've got, a, a, I think, a very valuable collection uh, that'll be useful for those, for those scholarships. But Hildy mentions we don't need to read through it chronologically. That's true, although I'm hoping that at least some people will, uh, will consider working their way through it in its entirety in the order we've presented them here. I think it's a, a rare opportunity to have the chance to follow a major critical figure across decades of her thinking in an area. Reading the book chronologically gives a sense of the ideas that endured in Hildy's work, others that are tested and dropped, and so on. But there's no need, it's true, to be so uh, method, uh, methodical. Because apart from the introduction and the afterward, these are all standalone pieces. They read well on their own. 
Readers can simply look in the table of contents or in the index to see what interests them and follow their interests. I assume many of us who are interested in work by Rudy Weeb or Dai and others that will be interested in going to the close readings and reading that through the eye of Hildy, which is a treat. Those who are interested in critical conversations but new to this particular field may want to start with one of Hildy's wide-ranging, historicizing arguments about Mennonite literature that were given as those state of the uh, field addresses at Mennonite writing conferences over the years. We've included three. One from the fourth conference at Bluffton University in 2006, one from the sixth conference at EMU in Virginia in 2012, and another from the seventh conference that was held at uh, Fresno Pacific in California in 2016. And those of you who just want a good read and are looking for the most accessible of the essays might consider beginning with one of the two here that were published as, or first given as invited talks for general public. One was in the honor of the, or in honor of the chair of Mennonite studies at the University of Winnipeg, and the other was given to mark the launch of the Mennonite studies program at the University of the Fraser Valley. Both these pieces, Critical Thought and Mennonite Literature in 2004, and the previously unpublished and imagined coherence in 2010, are especially engaging and enlightening. When speaking to a more general audience, Hildy proves more willing to risk definitions of her key terms, to lay out her claims more boldly, and to reflect, I think, more openly on the field's accomplishments, its limitations, and also its potential. But in general, I would simply encourage readers to enjoy the collection. Hildy is a, a wonderful writer. Sometimes we reserve that title, Mennonite Writers, for the creative writers, and for good reason most of the time. But Hildy is a wonderful writer, and as I've noted elsewhere, her essays are always a recognizable thing. Her prose is careful but disarmingly clear, and always confident, stylish even. And she has some characteristic gestures, such as her habit of using one-word sentences whenever she's getting worked up on a point. So I suggest you hold on whenever you come across a sentence like one of these. Perhaps, period. <laughs> <laughs> or indeed, period. Or my personal favorite, uh-huh, period. <laughs> Well, that's enough for me, I think, for tonight. Hildy, can you read some from the book for us, please? All right, so I'm going to write, I'm going to uh, provide a few introductory remarks and some readings. So I'll begin here. Certain questions inevitably surface when you talk about the creative writing of a particular people. If we're to speak of Mennonite literature, for example, we might want to begin with this, what do we mean by Mennonite? This is not an insignificant question. When we gather in person or in print to celebrate Mennonite's writing, what sort of assumptions are we making? What commonality do we give expression to? Mennonites are not alone in asking these sorts of questions. Creative writers and critics focused on any of the diverse literary traditions of North America ask these questions too. What do we mean by Jewish or Asian when we talk about writing, for example? I remember how during the first Mennonites writing conference that took place here at Grable in 1990, a now deceased Grable faculty member challenged the poet Patrick Friesen, demanding to know on what basis Patrick could call himself a Mennonite. Patrick was bewildered and hurt by the question and the rather aggressive tone with which it was asked. Who or what is a Mennonite? The question persists. In 2004, I wrote, who is a Mennonite? How do you define the Mennonite writer? Can you call yourself a Mennonite if you're not a believer? Is a novel about a Mennonite community composed by a Mennonite unbeliever a Mennonite novel? I can't help but think that the sorts of questions that dog members of the literary community must find their parallel in Mennonite studies generally. Who are the Mennonites now? How might we describe our newly configured communities? And that persistent troubling line between ethnicity and religion, where does it belong? Is it ever fixed? Does it matter? 
Still dogged by that question six years later in 2010, I ventured this, the term Mennonite is, as we all know, a deeply political term. It's a contentious term because perhaps quite rightly, the many people who would like to own it do not agree on what it means. In Canada, practice makes it quite clear that Mennonite is both a religious and an ethnic term. It means at least these two things, just as many other words we use every day have multiple meanings. I like to think of it this way. My course in Canadian multicultural literature draws students from a range of backgrounds, among them a Kurdish Muslim, a Punjabi Sikh, a Dutch agnostic, a Bengali Hindu, a Portuguese Catholic, a Mennonite Catholic. As for me, I'm a Mennonite Mennonite. That is, a member of each and both ethnic or cultural and religious Mennonite communities, an inheritor and an adherent. I find it useful, perhaps necessary, to accept that Mennonite is both a religious and an ethnic or cultural term, and that the border between these two instances of the term is fluid, forever shifting. A Mennonite writer, it seems to me, is a writer who knows from lived experience what it means to be a Mennonite. And Mennonite writing is writing such a writer produces. Some might want to narrow the scope to say that Mennonite writing might be confined to writing about Mennonites such a writer produces. But regardless of whether or not a Mennonite writer's work deals explicitly with Mennonite subject matter, the writing tends to be richly informed by the experience of his or her having been Mennonite. Many of the Canadian writers we identify as Mennonite would describe themselves now as having no committed relationship with any particular congregationally based Mennonite community, even though they were likely nurtured within one. Still, in the vast majority of cases, they would acknowledge explicitly and or implicitly that their sensibility, their thinking, their view of the world and responses to it are richly shaped by the nature of their experience as Mennonites. Just as James Joyce's work, for example, was indelibly inscribed with his Dublin-based Irish Catholicism, even though he spent almost his entire life writing outside Ireland. So much Mennonite literature, like so much literature in general, addresses questions of identity, and identity is so deeply rooted in language. Well, that first generation of Mennonite writers who emerged in the wake of Rudy Weeb's early work surely wrote in English, but they didn't leave German or Low German, their mother tongues, behind. In fact, mother tongue functioned as a kind of shibboleth in Mennonite writing, like a secret code that confirmed an insider status to those in the know. Mother tongue I wrote in 1988 as it was a source of resonance for the insider, is used by many contemporary Mennonite writers to restructure ritualistically the ethos, the cultural and spiritual texture of a Mennonite world that no longer exists as an entity separate from the society around it. For 400 years, over 400 years, mother tongue functioned as shelter for the Mennonites committed to existing as a people apart. Now, as the Mennonite world becomes ever more dispersed, its literary artists are evoking a past world in the words and syntax of German and Low German. The use of German and Low German in contemporary Canadian Mennonite literature is extensive. Rudy Weeb uses German phrases to evoke the repressive piety of Jakob Friesen V in the Blue Mountains of China, for example. Armin Weeb uses low German words, phrases, epithets, syntax throughout his humorous novel, The Salvation of Yash Siemens, to evoke the primal, sometimes coarse, personal life of Yash, a village bumpkin. David Walner Taves uses German liberally in his poems. Patrick Friesen quotes at the end of the shunning, O oh, das ich tausend Tungen hätte, O oh, that I had a thousand tongues, the opening words of one of the Mennonites' most widely used invocational hymns. With this resonant phrase, Friesen embraces his implied Mennonite audience by stimulating it to recall a seemingly lost world where the coherence of community was assured by the resonating, integrating power of congregational singing, a familiar verbal ritual. 
Audrey Paker in her collection of poems aptly named I Sing for My Dead in German, both evokes and laments the loss of mother tongue that once confirmed the common identity of individuals who were otherwise generations or even worlds apart. She writes, I tell Großmama the line in Armin Wiebe's book about Himmelfahrt being the day when Jesus goes to heaven and Mennonites to Winnipeg. <laughs> and she laughs until she almost verschlucks herself. <laughs> Ein Wieb dann noch. Yes, but no relation. Grandmama, I say, Grandmama. But can't remember the low German <laughs> word for love. Mennonite writers, especially in the robust early days of this era in Mennonite's writing, conjured up evocative memories of Mennonite family and community life. While reflecting especially in their early work on the families and communities that nurtured them, they often challenged the givens by which they had been urged to live and questioned certain official stories or master narratives. Of course, the challenging of the official story or to employ the language Rudy Weeb uses in his first novel, Peace Shall Destroy Many, the questioning of the ways of the fathers, began in Mennonite literature some decades ago. When Weeb's novel first appeared in 1962, many Mennonites did not take easily to the fact that it challenged the idealized projects of community leadership, and by implication, questioned the fixed set of protocols by which at least some Mennonites had come to live. One of the most compelling questions for Mennonite writers in the 80s and 90s concerns the apparent contradictions that had become so palpable in the Mennonite ethos itself, where the codes that once gave shape and coherence and meaning to the members of a community seem to function, if at all, in fragmented ways. A question implicit in many of the stories and poems produced by writers who have been nurtured in Mennonite communities in Canada, especially in the second half of the 20th century, is what to make of a world that once seemed to so many to be whole. This is the world Di Brandt, mixing irony and nostalgia, calls not the worldly world out there full of complacency and sin, but the Mennonite world, the real world of flower gardens and apple trees and green villages with names like Blumenort and Rosengarten showing visa both gentle and proud. A world which on closer examination, many writers came to think, appears to have had really little coherence at all. It seemed to many of the writers that they were compelled to negotiate living in two often incommensurate worlds, the Mennonite world the family and community that nurtured them, and the worldly world in which they would need to thrive if they were to survive as professional writers. Some resorted to coaxing their readers, Mennonites and non-Mennonites alike, to recognize their dilemma and commiserate with them while they wondered aloud where they belonged. I'm thinking of Julia Kasdorf and Di Brandt, for example, both of whom embraced what Kasdorf would later call the important, somewhat glamorous roles of transgressor and exile. In a similar vein, Di Brandt, in retrospect, reflects on writing herself into scandal and success. Each one of them was and recognized herself to be a trailblazer and found currency in embracing her role as the bold, even audacious individual who would dare to challenge the boundaries generally accepted by other participating members of her community. This act of rebellion and subversion shattered my identity as I knew it at the time, Brandt declared later, adding that she had had to recognize in herself the rebel, traitor, thief, willing to sell out, blow up, throw away the family stories and the official narratives of the culture for art. Would she be killed, she wondered, for this act of utter betrayal. The relationship of Mennonite readers and Mennonite writers to the communities that nurtured them is complicated. They might very well collectively share certain representations of the past and certain continuities of meaning, but their responses to the past are by no means the same. 
There's a lot of ambiguity lingering in many Mennonites' relationships with their past, and Mennonite writers are adept at expressing their conflicted sensibilities. Consider, for example, the fact that various writers of Mennonite heritage in various contexts have resisted in diverse gestures and tones being identified as Mennonite writers. In effect, invoking a gesture by Philip Roth, who has famously said, I am not a Jewish writer. I am a writer who is a Jew. Many Canadian Mennonite writers have been compelled to ponder the question of how to slough off a cultural heritage rich with literary potential and with an ever larger audience keen to encounter Mennonite material and at the same time continue to draw on their own lives to write, as writers tend to put it, what they know. Such a writer's dilemma has found its way into Mennonite fictions where it's carried by characters confronted with these sorts of questions. What does that religious and or cultural heritage have to do with me? How do I negotiate this Mennonite landscape without becoming entrapped within it? How do I, what would it mean to be a writer who has stepped outside the Mennonite culture altogether? And the Mennonite reader, what does the Mennonite reader want of me anyway? What about the Mennonite community? What does the community do with the writers who refuse to keep the peace and also refuse to go away? What about Mennonite readers who find themselves on the outside of their own communities but gravitate towards every new text by a Mennonite writer? Around 2006, I spent a weekend at a strategic planning session here at Grable. Foremost on the agenda, was the question about where the college should find itself, say, three or five years from, home, from now. A committed Grable alumnus spoke up forcefully and often. We must support the research activities of the Grable faculty, he demanded. After all, these are the scholars who will tell the Mennonites who they are and where they're from and where they might steer the Mennonite enterprise for decades to come. That he was referring exclusively to historians and theologians soon became evident. We must support and encourage those academics who are committed to the task of telling our story, he urged, adding, without an ounce of humor, otherwise Miriam Taves will have the last word. <laughs> this was 2006. Miriam Taves' A Complicated Kindness had come out and won the Governor General's Award in 2004, and she had won Canada Reads in 2006. So she was, she was at the top of mind for a number of Mennonites. I'm not sure, I wrote, as I continued here, that Miriam Taves would want the last word. In fact, although her comments about Mennonites as she experienced them in her smallish rural city of Steinbach, Manitoba, have been almost as controversial, it could be argued, as the early work of Rudy Weeb, she actually remains remarkably positive about these people and the complicated kindnesses she has observed among them. In fact, the remarks of the young scholar at that weekend meeting say much more about a Mennonite community's conflicted sensibility, its ambivalence about the fiction writer and the projects of literature, than they do about the vision articulated by any individual writer. Every new Mennonite writer who addresses matters related to the Mennonites reveals the power of literature both to shape and bring into circulation characters and images that are shared across generations, and to destabilize memories by provocati provocatively opening up cracks in the consensus. The Mennonite community expressed shock at the appearance of Rudy Weeb as a writer of fiction in 1962. Today, members of the community are bewildered that there are so many Mennonite writers and that, unlike Joseph Duick in Weeb's dissenting, mouth, Weeb's dissenting mouthpiece in Peace Shall Destroy Many, they have come to stay. Literary texts play a variety of roles in the formation of cultural memory. By communicating and sharing among members of a community images of the past, cultural memory serves to stabilize and convey a society's self-image. Literature, it could be argued, plays a significant role in the production of cultural memory and so also in the construction of community, offering the reader of a literary text 
The possibility of adhering to a community without having to live in terms of the community's norms. That is, an outsider might find in a novel, for example, a kind of homeland. American poet Robert Frost once wrote, home is the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. I belong to a generation of Mennonites among whom many did not find Frost's observation to be true. Many of my friends were excommunicated or disinvited from the Mennonite church, and hence, because many Mennonites have tended to conflate religious and cultural identities from their home institutions, their home communities, pardon me. There are a lot of Mennonite exiles out there. My husband Paul speaks of them as the lost ones, those who have fallen into what he calls the Mennochasm. You can count them all the way through Mennonite literature. People like Peter Neufeld in Patrick Friesen's The Shunning, or Nomi Nichol and her mother Trudy and her sister Tosh in Miriam Taves' A Complicated Kindness. Or Mike in Di Brandt's poem about this lost generation. Where was God when all these young men felt their souls crumble to dust, she asks. And where's my long lost brother, Mike, who might have inherited the earth with me? Menno, where's Mike? Mennonite religious dogma often makes it hard for Mennonites to think of those lost souls as our own, but they are. And I know that often Mennonite literature has been and is for these exiles a place of refuge. Finally, a few excerpts from my afterword. I've always been interested in the expanded literary text. That's another way of saying that I have a persistent interest in literary community as a phenomenon, and in broader literary contexts. Among the plethora of factors that inevitably come into play for a literary movement, such as the one I have obsessed about for half a century, I would never want to dismiss the individual text. But I am most persistently intrigued by how authors and texts and contexts interact with each other. The literary work is, to be sure, a thing unto itself and deserves a certain kind of attention as such. But I've always wanted to know more about the larger world out of which a work and its author emerged. To be sure, I read in order to save the virtuosity of the literary moment. But I think I'm not alone in taking particular pleasure in recognizing a gesture or an emotion that is somehow uncannily familiar. I appreciate how creative people make art out of an everyday that resonates with my own experience. <laughs> After all, although the ethnological ground sustaining the early literary expressions of Mennonite writers has receded, the fact that they experienced a distinctive culture and the ways in which that culture has been explored in literary texts prevails. Like many of the peers of my own generation, I grew up among stories of other people's lives. There was little in what was available for me to read that in any way defined my experience. As a child of refugee immigrants, growing up with German-speaking parents, and regularly attending a German-speaking church in what was then the fourth largest city in Canada, then those early prose and poetry texts by Mennonite writers began to appear and proliferate. So in what sense did Mennonite literature in effect identify me and my peers to myself, ourselves, confirm and affirm our existence. Because of the common experiences Mennonite writers and readers of the era of which I speak share a greater than usual understanding of certain subtexts, as with the members of any reasonably cohesive group of living people living in similar circumstances at the same time. Many of the creative writers who published work in the closing decades of the last century recreate and redefine community ceremonies and family relationships that were then readily identified as typical of Mennonite institutional community and family life. Many of them present that once familiar world objectified, made strange. To a large degree, they evoke and provide commentary on fragments of Mennonite experience that in the context of a seemingly more coherent world of belief and community practice were once assumed to make sense. Some of the narratives and poems they wrote then 
evoke with a poignant sense of loss what the particular Mennonite world the writers might have known had to offer that was kind and thoughtful, sympathetic. Others present a more critical appraisal of the Mennonite community as they knew by challenging and interrogating the values, dogmas, ceremonies, and traditions that for many years formed the base of the Mennonite community consciousness. A consciousness that publicly defined itself in terms of Christian discipleship and elevated religious experience, chastity and fidelity, mutual aid, truth telling, hard work, and traditional ways. And that was acknowledged, often reluctantly, but time and again, as falling short of these ideals. The fiction and verse of this era reveal some of the dissonances and discontinuities they refer to. But things change, evolve. At the close of the last century, I observed that the writers who took us by storm in the 80s were beginning to shift their focus. They were no longer asking, what sort of Mennonite world was it that we grew up in? They were beginning to explore instead, what sort of world do we live in now? And what does it mean to be a Mennonite within this worldly world? Writers new to the field were beginning to ask these questions too. The challenge that confronted fictional and real characters alike became how to identify, describe, or represent the Mennonite in the 21st century in North America. In many cases, of course, they might take little or no notice of anything Mennonite at all, but many did and they do so from the uncommon perspective and with fresh eyes. Finally, one observation from 2004, 20 years ago. The Journal of Mennonite Studies was the first among the serious Mennonite journals, I refer here to Mennonite Quarterly Review and Conrad Grable Review as well, to take seriously the Mennonite literary community and to encourage its reading audiences to do the same. This is not necessarily a given. As the Mennonites well know, communities are not uniformly eager to hear what their writers have to say. For literature reveals a community to itself as no other field or discipline is likely to do. Because it takes liberties in pursuing so freely what we conventionally refer to as truth. Because literature is by its very nature unruly because it presumes to enter the territory of human intimacy. Rudy Weeb observed in 1990, quote, I see no point in writing imaginatively unless it is done with both a critical coldness and an intense compassion. The simultaneous brilliance and stupidity of human beings deserves nothing less. And I wrote here, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> The sociologist might tell us how it seems we tend to function as a group. The historian or anthropologist might remark on how Mennonites in general or even certain individuals have comported themselves in times past. The theologian might write descriptively or prescriptively about the manner in which we might encounter God. But the novelist and the poet presume to utter our innermost thoughts, our desires and fears, anticipations and disappointments. The writer foregrounds the individual close-up and often invites the identification of his or her audience in a way none of the other observers of the nature of experience can do. I added one paragraph yesterday. The exciting conversation between Mennonite writers and their communities is far from over. Last night, I spent some time with the latest edition of the Canadian Mennonite magazine. It featured prominently Rudy Weeb's first novel, Peace Shall Destroy Many, published in 1962. In his editorial, Will Braun confessed that he was new to Weeb's work and had only recently come to recognize that the Mennonite church has what Braun calls an odd relationship with literature. He had arrived at the realization that, quote, Novelists, like poets, do something different than theologians, preachers, and historians. They open other doors, tap other realms. Indeed. <laughs> it is this that has continued to interest me these 50 years.
Well, we've gotten a rich taste of uh, what's in this book. I imagine uh, those reflections provoked some thoughts and perhaps some questions. Um, maybe we could take about 10 minutes here uh, at the end for a few of those. We've got a roving mic, so if you have a question, why don't you stick your hand up and I'll come around. You can speak into the mic so that everyone can hear you. I'm wondering, Hilde, if you go back and look at your earlier essays, I find if I go back, I'm trying to put something together now, I change my mind. Maybe it's because I'm writing more on science, that my ideas change because evidence changes, but surely as the field changes, you might have written something in 1985 or 1990, and maybe you would know that from editing. We can't put this in because it was so, that was Hilde then, but Hilde has things differently now. Did you do that? In, did you edit, edit the essays themselves in order to take out things which you said, I'm not going to say that anymore? Uh, is it wrong? One second. It's a really, really good question. Um, and, and Rob will undoubtedly have some thoughts about it too. Uh, the last part of your question, we did, not, we did not do any substantive editing. The whole notion was that we were going to publish what was there. I think you pointed. I think you point out the salient feature here, and that is, I mean, you're writing, along with your creative work in literature, you're writing as a scientist, and undoubtedly there are things you said that have been shown to be, you know, untrue. But I think the nature of my writing was such that, I mean, when I think of it, and Rob hinted at this, it was really, it was much more. Okay, I said this, and then this, and then it was a kind of a, it was a kind of a trajectory. Does that? Right? Um, so anyway, that's, that's how I'd respond to that. So no, we didn't rewrite anything. I mean, that was, that was the premise, because that would be a huge amount of work. Um, and, and we just didn't allow ourselves the, the potential to do that. Can I ask yeah. Something? yeah, this is a great question. Uh, I think I'll stand up. So this was a point of some discussion at the beginning as well. Well, this essay has that. Maybe I don't, I wouldn't say it quite like that anymore. And I think the argument that I made there, and I would still make here, is that if she was willing to be generous and allow those things to come back into a prominent place here, it's really valuable to see the trajectory of thought. Like, it's okay that 40 years ago, you took a stand on something and said, I think this. And look, numerous essays return to these questions later in the collection and say something quite different. And that's not a problem unless you were hoping to sort of hide that earlier work or that sort of trajectory of thinking. So I think it's a gracious model of a text to say, no, that's OK. I wouldn't say that anymore. But look, stacked up against each other, we can see the trajectory and the evolution of the, of, of the argument. I think that's really, something really lovely about that. Hi, John Siebert. It's really a pleasure to hear these things. I think I wrote my first academic article, uh, essay, on Rudy Reed in 1979. I got a B. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> the definition of what's literature, I'm curious about the pop side. Have we got Mennonite police procedurals on the horizon? Have we got horror stuff? Have we got, I mean, uh, human sexuality, intimacy novels? What's on the future? Uh, we do have horror. In fact, uh, a really spectacular novel called Night Bitch, which is being made into a movie uh, about a woman who thinks she's turning into a dog. Um, so, and, and of course, we've got all kinds of, you mentioned, I mean, the work that Jonathan Dick does with um, um, graphic novels and so on, so that's a different. Um, but you're making me think, I mean, your, your question provokes me to think about an experience I had probably 20 or 30 years ago, where with Julia Castro, actually, the writer from Pennsylvania, um, Paul and I went to visit David Luthi, who is someone who joined the Amish, and some of you will know of David Luthi, and he became, because he was well-educated, he became the, the um, archivist for, for the Amish. And he, and Julie was really interested in what he was doing, and, and he spent an afternoon with us. 
And he explained to us that he was collecting anything in popular culture that had that said anything about the Amish, including Playboy magazines. <laughs> and he even said, you know, people ask him, how do you tell if they're Amish if they're not wearing any clothes? <laughs> stuff out there, and, and I'm sure there are some things wrong, I know, but you're sort of, you're younger than one or two. So yes, there is a huge amount of material out there. Um, there is, of course, this massive world of Amish and with them in a romance novels, of course, Bonnet mm -hmm. yeah. Rippers, as it's called. Um, there is that there are horror stories, there's fantasy, there's a whole series about these Amish vampires in space, for example, uh, which of course not quite nice. Uh, so there is a, a, a wide range. Now, a couple of quick thoughts on that. One is you're putting your finger on the questions of what counts in these sort of scholarly academic conversations, right? Uh, and there's no question that that has been sometimes a pretty narrow range. And people are doing some work to sort of say, well, hold on, what else outside of sort of literary fiction or uh, you know, really earnest poetry is being published. And so there's a, not only what's coming up now, sort of a wider range, but also a, a, a move by some academics to look back and say, what have we missed? What about all this children's uh, there that have been published over the years? What about these church-sponsored young adult novels? What about uh, film and graphic novels that are coming out? So there is this sort of retrospective rethinking, not only of what uh, has been that we may have overlooked, but also these larger genres kind of on the edges of the work. And one of the most exciting areas there might be in life writing. So going back and taking a closer look at the dozens and dozens of uh, memoirs, some of them self-published and others formally published, or other diaries that have been published and so on, looking back for the literary elements of this as well. So there is just no shortage of work. You're welcome back into the field if you want to take it a stab at one of those essays. <laughs> But I guess the B. Uh, <laughs> uh, one more question. Hi, I'm Conrad Burke. <laughs> that was a wonderful presentation. For me. <clears throat> it makes me want to read the book as soon as possible. A question that occurred to me. Um, while you were talking, and then you really made it salient for me in your last paragraph. But it's a question that I'm not sure is well formulated, and as I age, I am less confident in the questions that I form on the spur of the moment. Um, so you can say, oh, that's not a very coherent question. But it's this one. It, you said at the end in that last paragraph about the difference between literary writing and historical writing and anthropological, anthropological writing, sociological writing, and so on, right? And the difference in, in the literary writing. <clears throat> and what I was thinking about as I was listening to you it was, is Hilly doing sociology of writing? In sociology of Mennonites, or anthropology of Mennonites, it sounded a lot like it to me in your presentation. But you call yourself, and uh, Rob called you a literary critic, which is something else, and you didn't mention it. But literary, would, would you define yourself as a literary critic in what you do in terms of? Uh, analyzing my literature, or do you think of yourself as a sociologist? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go up here. Thank you, Conrad. Um, that's a clear question, that's, um, and it's a fair question. And I think, in a way, uh, it was uh, responded to by the poet Leonard Neufeld, who's in on the West Coast. Uh, who for the he was the first person to refer to me as a literary historian, uh, and and it, it made a certain amount of sense to me. But I'm definitely functioning in the field of literature. And when when I think about you know I mean, what I, where I thought you were going to go is well how do you distinguish between the writing of let's say a sociologist and the writing of a literary critic, and and I think we're we're simply really and truly looking for different things. You know I mean. 
we're, we're just genuinely just looking for different things. And, and we might come up with answers that overlap, but, but we're really looking, I think, for different things. But others might. Rob, do you have a response to that? Or anybody else? <laughs> I thought, I mean, my, my huge memory of, of no, I, I'm going to rephrase that. One of my striking memories of Conrad in faculty council meetings way back was Conrad, and it was always really insightful and hugely articulate, but it was always, you know, we're up against the wall on some matter, and everybody's just sort of all over the place, and Conrad many, many, many times said, you know, you know what the trouble is here? We're really talking about two different things. <laughs> and in a way, your question almost, almost goes there, but yeah. <laughs> that was great. I learned a lot from that. <laughs> I thought maybe you'd say, it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, because I don't want to be called a sociologist. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, Hildy and Rob, again for your words uh, this evening, your reflections. I'll echo Hildy's thanks to Birgit and Jen and Margaret uh, and everyone else that uh, provided support in putting this evening's activity together. Thank you all for coming. Again, you're invited downstairs now to the atrium, something to drink, something to eat, and to buy Hildy's book, which is being offered at a discount price of $30, uh, including tax. You can pay by cash, check, card uh, of any color. Um, and there's a bonus as well. Every purchaser of the book uh, gets a, another book alongside that. Uh, in that same Canadian Mennonite issue that uh, was just referenced, there was an interview with Hildy, and she was asked, where should somebody new in their interest in, in Mennonite literature start? And she mentioned this volume, Liars and Rascals. You get to pick one of those up if you buy Hildy's book for free. Uh, or Eleven Encounters with Mennonite Fiction, which is another kind of edited volume, right? So further encouragement uh, for you to pick that book up downstairs. Look forward to seeing you down there. Thanks again.